Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work for IBM Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This is part two of a series, N1 Advanced Topics. I've learnt from hard-won experience to never tell a friend, gosh, your baby's really ugly. Now, N1 is my baby, and if people email me saying, your tool is rubbish, I just delete the email, regardless of what the question is. But I know that N1 isn't perfect, but it may be a lot better than perhaps you think. In this video, we'll be looking at this list of advanced topics. We'll see how far we get in the time allowed. Right then, number one. There's an old saying, isn't there, in the IT industry, RTFM, read the flaming manual, N1-H. This is how you get the help information from the N1 command. And a lot of these things that we're going to cover now are actually documented in there. Quite often when I get email, I'm thinking, oh, well, I do actually respond, how can I get you to read the flaming manual? It's already in there. F and F abuse. If you read the N1-H, it says in the data collection mode, the minus F must be the first option on the line. It switches off interactive mode. Saves the data to comma separated value spreadsheet format dot N1 file in the local directory. It also sets the minus S, that's the number of seconds between snapshots to 300, that's five minutes, and minus C, the number of captures, 288. This means it will run for a day. So if you have a command that looks like this with your own options in here, then hit the F. This F will reset practically all the parameters you could have already typed in. So what you've typed in there is ignored and it will just run these defaults in here plus any options you put further on down the line. When you use the minus F option, it creates a very special name of the data file, which is the host name underscore date and time in a particularly nice order so that if you use the ls command the files come out in host name and then date and time order 99.9% .9 of the admins that create their own file name using the minus f option the capital f option are dumb well, which I mean they're making a file name which is far worse than the default and they're having to write whole shell scripts and call the date command and reformat things and then you know the months don't come out the right order and the days of the week don't come out in the right order and you're thinking what are you thinking man in actual fact if I ever see anybody using the minus capital F option then that means that I, their IQ has gone significantly low and I have to make assumptions that this person really doesn't know what they're doing. Another option is you can use the minus M and then the directory and then N1 will change to that directory and save the file in that directory. That is enough to let you decide what the directory is called and then use the default file name. That means you don't need a shell script to run nmon out of a cron tab file right let's move on to tip two you can edit nmon files yes you can they are just text files made a very clear decision early on let's keep these things simple if we can now if the nmon files get very large we're talking of hundreds of megabytes you'll find that the lxvi command will not actually allow you to edit them they're too big i think it's a 32-bit application or something um, you can install vim the gnu vi program onto aix it's the default on linux much better it'll handle much much bigger files now, if you actually look at the data structure, it is absolutely obvious. Well, it is if you've been looking at them for 25 years. So let me give you a few clues of what you're going to find in here. First of all, at the top, there's a bunch of lines starting AAA. Uh, these, these are named like this so that if you sort the file, they'll all come together in particular groups. But anyway, we don't have to sort files anymore. The downstream tools do that for you. But the AAA section is the basic info. This is what host you're on, what the time and date is, what the command you actually run, a few things like that. Not the username, for example. Then there's the BBB sections, which go through the configuration by running a bunch of commands and saving their output. That can take some time on big computers, you know, with hundreds of disks, perhaps. Then there's the BBBP settings. This is the detailed config. Maybe some of the way the network settings are, are put in, or maybe the tuning options for the operating system there in this BBBP section. Then in the bulk of the file, this is a sort of run only once. In the bulk of the file, we're going to have these uh, sections in here. 
I'll call it ABC uh, because there'll be a group for like the CPU stats, the disk stats, the memory stats, the network stats, and so on for all the resources inside the machine. And these lines will have a, a title line which has um, a particular name which is the which will actually be the name of the graph that we create later on then we have the column description so this will be the particular stat uh, and maybe the units that is actually in then when we actually get to the data we have these zzz lines so this has this is the time stamp number that we have for when we're collecting one set of uh, stats and that has the date and time now this was introduced very early on when the spreadsheets couldn't cope with the volume of data and so rather than repeating the time and date for every line of data we actually saved it once in this line and then use these T numbers for the rest of the line so these this ABC will be CPUs and disks and memories and networks and those sorts of things the timestamp that we have to look up this line to find out when it actually happened and then we'll have all the data columns that we named in that title line uh, at the start of the file and then so would be a whole bunch in, the, in here uh, and then it would stop and then however many seconds you asked Enmon to wait between snapshots it starts up again and the first thing it will output is a ZZZ line with a new timestamp in here and then the, collect the data again and so it goes on uh, adding records to the file as required. If you actually get to the proper end of the Enmon it actually recaptures some of these um, BBBP stats in case you change the tuning parameters during the day so now if the file is too big and it's crashing your downstream tools particularly like the uh, the analyzer and things then you could open your Edmon file and you get to a ZZZ line well not number two maybe record which says uh, T9000 and if you delete that ZZ line and what's below you can then shorten the file and maybe you can survive going through your analyzing and graphing tool. Now topic number three used to find disk groups. In AX has very simple naming convention for its disks HD0 to HDisk1234 etc up it goes. Maybe longer than 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago now, um, we ended up with hundreds or even thousands of disks on our servers. CPUs are going faster, memory is going up a little bit, but disks were not going faster. So the only way you could get your I.O. rates up was to have lots and lots of disks into the thousands. And I've seen reports with 4,000 disks in them. The trouble is, if you then draw a graph of 1,000 disks over time, uh, zero to 100% busy, you end up with this, a great big black box. You draw f a thousand lines in a box and you just can't see anything in there. And I used to get complaints from customers saying, well, this is unmanageable. And the answer is yes, a thousand disks or more is unmanageable. You can't see what's going on or manage them. Ironically, about then, these big disk subsystems came out where you have them on the end of a SAN or it's called SSA in the early versions. That actually put all the disks in Iran Great Big Pile, you could manage it separately. But for some strange reason, if we had um, 8 gigabyte disks, they were giving us 8 gigabyte LUNs rather than sort of making them bigger at the other end and taking the manpower to manage 4,000 disks and actually providing the hardware to do that for us. What we need to do if we got a lot of disks is to classify them into groups so then we want to manage the monitor and see the groups of disks rather than individual disks and this is what this option gives us. So we're going to create a disk group, uh, we're going to create a little file, let's just call it DG for the sake of convenience. We're running a database, so it's got the data disks, uh, where all your information is held. You've got index disks for fast lookups in that data. Sometimes we can only need to get the index to actually get the data as well. Then we have the logs, which are running usually very busy, saving all the records so we can have the ACID properties on the relational database. And then we've got a couple of disks on the side where the uh, operating system is actually running. So in this little file we're going to have a, a any name you'd like in here data and then the h disks involved with the disks that have the data on it then the same for disks with indexes disks for the logs and a couple of disks for the os we create this little file and when we start up nmon we give it a minus g and the name of that file 
And then if when it's running we hit a G um, or if we're capturing it it will save our descript data and you can see in here here it's grouped the disk together it says okay you name something called data it had eight disks in it you can double check that it understood them all in here uh, then it, it can give you the average disease of that group of disks the reads and the writes the total transfers block size and all those sorts of things in here now I faked up the data in here just to give you a little worked example but you get the idea now we're not looking at 16 things we're looking at four things and this will scale up very nicely if you got lots and lots of disks. We actually use this feature quite a lot in benchmarks in uh, Montpellier. We had uh, one very big machine connected to four disk subsystems, they were called sharks in those days, and so we actually named a disk group with all the disks in one of the sharks, in fact in a rank, in a, uh, in a row in, inside the disk subsystem, and then we got visibility if you like of the actual disks and where the data was actually going and how we could lay it out and we could actually get a real grip of what was going on in the lower level actual disks themselves. Anyway that's when we invented this thing and got it running. So on the Linux side of things, things are a little bit like the wild, wild frontier. Um, I've seen the disk names being very complicated with all sorts of punctuation symbols in there. This is because if somebody invents a new disk drive, they connect it to their adapter, and it's the device driver adapter software that defines what the naming conventions are all sorts of bizarre things in there. To make it more complicated, the Linux proc disk stats doesn't have disk stats in it. It has disk stats and partitions. Now in smaller machines it's quite common for one disk to actually have a whole bunch of partitions. You can see down in here disk B has one, two, three partitions on it. Once you get into bigger relational databases and you've got a hundred disks, well you just have one partition per disk. But it does mean you have double counting. You have some stats in here for what's going on for the actual partitions. Now this is actually the output of an ls block command. Um, it's the similar sort of thing in the disk stats. So we have double counting already with uh, Linux and because of the ozone detection story, I didn't want to then sort of try and work out which ones was partitions and which ones are disks because we can't rely on the naming conventions to work that out. The SDAs of Bs are simple, I could have done that one, but the more complicated ones would drive you nuts. Now what is the undetected ozone layer story? Well, many years ago, people were looking at the ozone layer up at the um, North Pole and trying to work out what was happening with it. So I think they were sending radio waves to it and it was getting things bounced off it and they could work out how thick the ozone was. But there were lots of uh, erroneous readings. So sometimes uh, they'd send a radar up and an aeroplane would fly back and they get back, instead of getting a sort of reading of uh, 100, they get rid of 10 million. Well, that was obviously fake data. We have to discount that. It doesn't count. And sometimes they send a, a radio pulse up and they, nothing comes back. Maybe the air pressure changed and the uh, power of the radio signal didn't actually get back to the ground station so they said well if it's zero uh, we'll ignore those as well that's obviously something happened in the air we don't understand um, but that meant for many years whenever the ozone went down to zero they discounted those values so they didn't actually spot the hole in the ozone layer for many years because they were filtering out their lines. So I didn't want to get in there that um, you may have a hundred disks and some obviously looked wrong or the name didn't, it wasn't understood and I deleted those disks out of your N1 data because I may be hiding the real problem on your computer and then everybody blames me for their problems on their computers. So I, re I refused to, to holistically try and work out these file names. Then Years later, we had this lsblk block command came in for block devices, um, and this is what it actually looks like. It looks on the screen. If you put in some extra letters, it'll actually put it out in sort of a text format that we can parse in the uh, in the C language. Okay, but then wouldn't you have? <laughs> wouldn't you just believe it with Linux? Um, it was distro dependent so the Susie and the Red Hats were outputting different things or the different options and even one of the distros uh, between the two different releases of it um, they actually changed what it meant as well so we had to work through all of those problems but now we can actually use that as a st stable and we worked out all the variations so with Linux now only in here you have the minus G 
auto feature and it uses the text version of the ls block command to come out to work out which is a disk and which is a partition and just gives you those disks and it does that by creating a disk group file that maps just disks to the disk name and and, and so on so there's a one-to-one -one mapping and the partition names are not in that user defined disk groups file so we can strip those out and get just down to the disks for AIX and Linux, if you're saving the data to a file, you've got a minus F option as the first option on the line. You'll find in the file that you'll have these uh, new records starting uh, DG, and these are the same sorts of busy read, write, size, and transfers as you get with your disks. And so these are where the data comes from. And you can see in here, in, this is my example, the header lines for them. And then they'll have the actual data lines further down the file. Actually, the AOX manual page for all this actually summarizes this quite nicely. Okay, that's enough video for part two. Next time we'll look at number four, Enmon External Data Collectors. Don't forget, give us a thumbs up if you like this video, learn something, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to be told when the next video comes out.